Hi, everybody. It's Mary Beth Decker with sacredgrove.com, where people and pets heal and connect. And I'm finally sitting down to interview one of my good friends, Judy Kane, with Aligned Consciousness. <laughs> Welcome, Judy. Hey, it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm so excited because I kind of took a hiatus off um, as and my animals were transitioning, and that is another whole story. But um, I'm back in this, back in the saddle, so to speak. Even though I don't ride horses naturally, <laughs> but you get the point. Um, so let me let me start with Judy's bio, okay? And I'm going to read it so that I am accurate. Here we go. Judy Kane, founder of Aligned Consciousness, helps people identify and transform the subconscious beliefs that keep them repeating ineffective, stressful patterns. Her clients experience change, which allow them to achieve their goals with ease and comfort. She is the author of Your Four Truths, How Beliefs Impact Your Life. Judy also hosts workshops and presents in group sessions, conferences, and podcasts. Originally from Richmond, Virginia, she lives near Tampa Bay, Florida, usually with a rescued cat or dog or two as part of her household. So, um, yeah, and you know, the reason I'm able to do these things is you and I worked about my uh, discomfort, high discomfort with being on video. And uh, it, obviously it's made a big difference. I'm, I'm doing Instagram and everything like that. Uh, but I wanted to start with a story. So maybe you could tell us a session uh, about one of the clients that you worked with and how things changed for them to make it more real, Judy. Sure. Um, so I, one of my favorite things, I don't get these that often, but one of my favorite things to do are phobias because I've never personally had a phobia client take a full session. We usually get rid of the phobia in part of the session, and then we can go on and change other things for the rest of the time. Uh, they might be an intense reaction, but they're usually pretty simple sourced. So it doesn't, it's not being caused by too many beliefs. So it's pretty easy to get rid of. So I like those because it's kind of instant gratification. Uh, but uh, so I had one client who was living in a house. Um, it wasn't her home, but she they were using the house as part of, of something that they were doing in this particular area, and it had mice in it, and she had a phobia of mice, mm -hmm. and she was like, you know, there were parts of the house that she had to go into because they were helping clean out possessions and things, and yeah, there were some rooms that it was just she really just couldn't even go into because she knew a mouse had been in there at some point in time and she didn't want to meet one face to face. And so uh, we work with that. We worked with the when I work with people with phobias, uh, the first thing we do is kind of try to neutralize the, the panic reaction. Mm -hmm. So that then we can see if there are other beliefs that are also causing discomfort with it, right? But the first thing is to get rid of the the reaction to the thing, uh, in this case, a mouse. Um, and the goal is never to make it so she's going to want to adopt 100 mice. But um, it, it would be nice to be able to choose your reactions, to choose your responses when confronted with one, right? Uh, right. So, yeah, that's what we do with phobias is get you to choose the response. Uh, so we we did. We, we worked on the emotion of it. I think there were a couple of follow-up belief statements that we did. Um, but it didn't it wasn't it didn't take long. You know, we got rid of the phobic response to the to the mice. And and I heard back from her, oh, I don't know, shortly thereafter, that she was actually able to go into all the rooms. It was not like, yeah, I mean, it was just like, she didn't like them. She didn't like them being there. She thought they were dirty. She she didn't want to be surprised by one particularly, but it wasn't that panic response at the thought of one. So she was able to do what she needed to do and without the stress that had been there. 
Well, you know, it's like almost being imprisoned in your own home. If you, there's places you can't go, <laughs> you know, no. it feels like a horror movie to me. Like, <laughs> oh, don't go in the basement because you, or don't go in your, <laughs> yeah, what a gift <laughs> to her to be able to roam freely in her home home. <laughs> yes, she was very appreciative of that. <laughs> I, you know, as you were saying that, I remembered another friend uh, who I, who had uh, trouble getting on a plane, and there, there there was very helpful to her. It was, I think, the first time after you'd worked with her that she was able to enjoy the trip rather than waiting. Uh, can I say it? Well, probably waiting to die or something like that. That's the strength of that phobia. So that was a. Uh, uh really cool example and I appreciate your suggesting me to her uh the it it was different in so many ways from a lot of the others because I also heard about her husband's response and he was so excited that now they could plan a vacation someplace they could fly <laughs> boy that's true oh good yeah so um I wanted to, to talk about changing beliefs because as, as I've worked with people and their animals, I have noticed that their beliefs create emotions and energies that affect their animals. So that's why, I mean, folks, this is the connection, you know, animal communicator, were you talking to somebody who changes human beliefs? Well, because we got them <laughs> and sometimes they don't work for us. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to an expert. Tell us about subconscious beliefs and why they matter. Um, sure. Yeah, just explain that for us, Judy. Okay. Please. So, yeah, because a lot of people don't, don't know the background of them uh, or how important they are. So when we come into this world, we run around for the first seven years just being little sponges. Right. We're absorbing all the beliefs that are in our environment um, to help us better cope with wherever it was we landed. Right. So we want to have the beliefs of the group that we're closest with. So we fit in, basically. Um, and some of these beliefs are really helpful. You know, they're safety related. Don't jump in front of a car. Don't put your hand in the fire. You know, there are things. And then there are other beliefs that we get that are um specific to the family or the institutions that we're uh most around that may or may not be helpful mm -hmm. but all these subconscious beliefs make up about 95 percent of the way we behave they form our entire paradigm it's the lens through which we see the world I so just stop it, you there if, if i can because sure. this is the thing that always blows me away because we think we're in charge like that's our conscious stuff yeah. and you tell I've heard this before but it always it's like only five percent of me yep. the other 95 percent are do something else that I'm not even conscious of what the yep. heck okay so I know. yeah <laughs> so it's really you know it it tells us things that we think aren't safe which like I said, some physical things, obviously, that's a that's a good thing to learn. But there are a lot of things you learn in a family that are risky, that aren't based on any fact of it being actually dangerous for you, right? So it might not feel like it's safe to be seen or to speak up, or it might feel like you don't deserve nice things, or that it's really hard um, to, to keep money. You know, we have to really work really hard at it, but it's not okay to have more than you need. I mean, there are all sorts of beliefs that get in there from family belief systems uh, that don't serve you well when you grow up, uh, sometimes not even as a child, but certainly once you grow up, if they're contrary to your conscious goals, they really slow you down. Yeah. It's stressful. You have to be focusing on it to do the thing that you're trying to do. And you can't focus on everything all the time. That's that 5%, right? And the rest of it is your default system basically kicking into action. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Sure. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about that in so many ways. That's true. Um, so. 
sorry, there's somewhere I want to go with this. How do we start to notice? And this could be in anywhere, any area. It could be business, relationships. And I know I'm talking about relationships with the animals. How do people start to notice that, hey, there might be a limiting belief here? Ah, uh, yeah. Clues. It's like pattern. Clues. <laughs> yeah. The clues that you might be looking for are always uh, related to patterns. So, because, you know, one instance of anything does not usually mean there's a subconscious belief there contributing to the, the, the distress, basically, of what's going on. But if you have a pattern of unsupportive relationships, you know, if you find yourself doing the same thing over and over again and not really even knowing why and not really wanting to, you just find yourself doing the same thing for no particular reason, that's a good clue. Yeah. Um, if if you've got these, these uh, situations or people that you get really stressed out thinking about uh, encountering, uh, a lot of people have a, pan, uh, um, a really strong emotional response when they think about writing a check or uh, hosting a dinner party or uh, people's fear of animals, right? I mean, these, these subconscious beliefs aren't subject to fact, logic, data. They're, it's irrelevant, right? People with a phobia of flying probably know it's safer to get on the plane than drive to the airport statistically. If that's not going to change the panic reaction when they think about having to fly. So people with a fear of dog, you know, I've seen lots of children, particularly when my girls were little, we always had pets, um, but children would come over and spend the night and be terrified sadly they were terrified of the big dogs and it was the little one they needed to watch out for but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know and and it was nothing that you could like explain to them you know that the dogs were just put in the bedroom with baby gate <laughs> until yeah. the, the sleepover was done right I mean that's the only way that, that I knew to deal with it at the time uh, but those, that's not, it might be there was a traumatic event in that child's past. It might be that their parents had a fear of dogs and they just transmitted it. It, it, it doesn't really matter where it comes from, it's, but it's, it's very limiting when you have it. It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. That, those are really good questions because I think people can start to think of in their own lives, oh, Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see where that could be a, a, a subconscious belief that I, I don't know where I got it, but it sure is hindering. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So, uh, you know, the main theme of this is, it seems to be stress. <laughs> Limiting beliefs cause stress. They and, do. Uh, yeah, they make things so hard to do. Maybe impossible, but definitely difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to shift it over because I'm thinking about our animals and the fact that they are so tuned into us. You know, as an animal communicator, uh, I talk to people about communicating with their animals, but the truth is their animals are already picking up so much of their vibration. Um, the, the, the equation I heard is thoughts create emotions, which Create beliefs and so but there's there's thoughts and emotions are energetic you could think of the nervous system firing stuff off and that's real and um you can think of an energy level that that is a vibration that's coming up for those of us who do energy stuff that's real and our, our animals are picking them up um and so for me it's i i have met people where they're, what I usually see is their stress is affecting their animals. And, um, and it's even a vicious cycle where the animal does something and something bad happens. And then the person starts to, I'm going to say it my way, there's now a belief somewhere or a fear back there that's like, this will happen again. This could happen again. And that creates 
more energy and then the, the animal picks it up and then you've got a whole thing going between them. Um, I'd love to hear your take on that. What, from a subconscious belief, we are, you know, clearing those out. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's it where, you know, the example you gave of, well, this happened once and now I'm going to worry about it. So you get stressed out and then the dog or cat or whatever uh, picks up on the stress and that can be a, a cycle for sure. You can have um, animals that, that worry because you get sad about something that's going on and they don't know what it is they just know that you're very very sad and they're they're empathetic right they they yeah. don't want you to be sad and so that worries them uh you can have um certainly the the hyper vigilant pet owner who's worried about every symptom of an animal is creating a stressful environment for that animal where they're <laughs> Well, but I mean, you know, it's same parents do the same thing. You've got helicopter parents, you've got helicopter pet guardians, um, you know, and, and that's stressful for the people that they're always on alert looking for a symptom, uh, you know, you've got to be wanting the best for your animals and not negligent, but you can cross over that line where it's a little compulsive right? <laughs> and yeah, um, yeah. And and, I have met people that have gone there. Um, yeah. And that's that's going to stress the animals out because the the guardian is stressed out. And it's interesting because when I notice those people and probably even um, in myself, that subconscious, for me, I'm having that feeling that a subconscious belief is that uh, if we do everything right, we will, it's our job to keep our pet healthy. Oh, that's true. It's, however, the hard part is nobody makes it out alive. Oh, good point. <laughs> so so there, I, the people even get to this, that they believe that they can do the, the there's a subconscious belief that if they just do the right thing, it's going to get better. And that's a hard one to let go when you love your, your animals probably um, human beings too. So yeah, I, that's how I, I've noticed it. I've never yeah. said it quite this way, but they really, there's really this engine running in them that I, it's my job to fix them. And, hmm. and that's a belief, you're right, that, that could be creating, you know, a lot more stress in your life than is necessary. Also, if if you're grieving for something with with the animal or with something else going on in the family, uh, grief is natural. You you don't want to not be sorry about something that's going to be or has recently been a loss. But if it starts impacting your life, like you know, if it's disabling for an extensive period of time, uh, that's that's going to cause the, the pets and the family to, you know, have some sort of a emotional response to your, where you are emotionally. Yeah. Um, um, one of my teachers was talking about that, that she had lost um, a beloved dog and she had just gotten a puppy and she next noticed that the puppy started moping and being so sad. And she she she's smart. <laughs> she doesn't. She noticed that there was that connection. Um, now her being an animal communicator, she was able to communicate to to say, "Well, I'm going to be sad for a while, but you didn't know that dog, and you, the best thing you can do for me right now is be your happy puppy self, because I need that energy." Right. Um, uh, but sometimes it's not that easy for us to shift. I, I'm thinking. In my own life, I know it's taken a while for that shift. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we have that. We have, we also hit. I mean, I remember someone 
And we, I don't know where her stress came from. She didn't even realize she was stressed and she was increasing the stress in her already nervous dog. And so that would have been, she finally did some things to take care of it, but that would be somebody you could work with too, right? I mean, Absolutely, yeah. when they don't even know what the stress is from. That doesn't really matter. That One of the nice things yeah. about the process that I use is uh, you don't re need to know where the belief comes from. Wow. So if it's like, uh, sadly, a lot of people I work with had some form of trauma in their childhood. Yeah. Uh, and they may not know what it was. They may know, but certainly they would have to re-traumatize themselves to tell me about it. I, we don't need to know where it comes from. We We work with what's there and change it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's a, a gentle way of getting at the heart of some of these things that are just, you know, not serving you well. That sounds really great. So, yeah, I'm thinking about all these, all of us that get stuck in that belief, in some kind of a belief where it takes us off course. Um, just to go off track a little bit, you've worked with people in business as well, right? That's that's why yeah. you're, yeah. Tell, just tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Well, there's so many things, you know, people will come usually because their business isn't doing as well as they would like. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's all sorts of different beliefs that can be causing that. I mean, the symptom might look the same, but the reasons can be so different. They can have a, a fear of being successful. Maybe they don't want to be seen. Maybe there's some conflicting money beliefs there. Um, it might be that you've got subconscious beliefs that are it's too expensive to be successful, that you would have to invest too much of your time or attention. And you've got other things you also want to spend time and attention on. So uh, there, the subconscious beliefs are protecting you from getting that out of balance situation in your life. Right. Uh, I've seen people with a belief that businesses have to have a slow start to be, you know, successful. So they have a very <laughs> slow start, very slow start. Don't want to rush it, right? <laughs> and then there's the fear of failure, right? Or a scarcity belief that there are not enough resources out there of some sort that you need, money, time, uh, clients, you know, all sorts of, of resources there. So, so I wanted to start out with our, our relationship to our animals because that was really important, but I just wanted people to hear all the good things that you do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and yeah. self esteem, there's so, you know, being able to set your boundaries mm. or be able to keep your time sacred for your priorities instead of switching your whole schedule around because somebody else comes in with an ask. <laughs> well, yeah, I get, well, yes. <laughs> Many of us have uh, wrestled with that one. That's really true. All these things are so true about, about work. I have a feeling that even if you don't have your own business, going to work every day, having worked for other people, all that stuff, you still have that sort of mentality. There are mentalities that we bring to our job as well. That, that one way or the other. I, you ha have you worked with people about, you know, even if they're not building their own business where they, they work, they go into work every day and they've got issues? And sure. Imposter syndrome is a big oh. one. Talk uh, about yeah. Maybe not yeah. everyone knows what that means. Okay, sure. It's It's like... You're doing your job, you're doing it well, but deep inside, you are sure that there's something wrong or missing with the way you're doing it. And eventually people are going to find out what that is. And it's going to be a horrible ending to, to this career or job or what, or at least extremely embarrassing. Right? Right. <laughs> so, um, you, you inside think you're an imposter because you don't believe you've got the skills or the knowledge or the gifts to do this job the way you think it should be done um and and so that's imposter syndrome and it can be hugely stressful for people 
Um, I've also seen with um, like people who work, at, this happened to me when I was in corporate, you know, I would leave large projects. I was an IT manager and, and, you know, some of the projects were huge. And, you know, at the end of a project, people would congratulate me as because I was like the project manager for the thing. And it was my, my response was always, well, it, you know, it wasn't me, it was the team. Well, and certainly it was team, you know, most of these projects had a hundred people on them. It was like, you know, couldn't have done that, done that myself. Uh, but if you never take a look at what your own contributions are, if you're not able to recognize your strengths, if you can't accept a compliment, right? I mean, those are all clues that you're not valuing your own uh, worth and contributions to whatever it was yeah and what's coming around to me is the reason i'm talking about this is um it seems like if and no i don't think it seems like it is a true thing i believe that most animals who live with people who are a bit happier and 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 grounded have have a better quality of life <laughs> Not 100%, right. I'm, not, I'm not making it all, but but overall, if we're, it's it's the old saying, if mama's happy, if mama ain't happy, nobody ain't happy, the other way around, if their beloved person is doing good, that's that has a, a wonderful effect on, on them, and uh, I don't think, I don't think there's any exception to that, that we, because that they're living they're living in our energy and they're they're committed to us you know as much as maybe more than we are to them sometimes <laughs> so, yeah I, probably more sometimes <laughs> sometimes we've got to say but but the fact of all these things that you could bring people to a place of well it sounds like peace and there's just a little bit of confidence and like I'm not carrying that stuff around anymore it's got it i got my little bunny over here oh. i'm gonna help her <laughs> or whatever whoever's her you to to anybody listening to whatever animals you have um what do you well i'm just i'm asking for feedback what do you think have you seen what have you what have you noticed in, in this yeah area? absolutely i think that's true i think it's true with animals i think it's true with everybody in the household right yes <laughs> uh, so you know I have observed some families where it, it, they're led and rambunctious and sometimes get a little overheated in their discussions <laughs> they, they don't <laughs> they don't tend to have the dogs that are sleeping quietly in the counter on the corner somewhere right the that energy spreads to the other animals and and so there's anxiousness and nervousness and uh I mean, not that it's a hundred percent but but i think it's you know more likely than not that the 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 vibe of the family extends through all of the, the animal members as well i, I think it's i think oh, one thing i thought about which it's a ter terrible example but i gotta say it's like if you're living in a toxic dump you're not getting away scot-free, probably. I'm being very harsh here, but and I'm not talking about any of us who's listening who are listening, but there are variations of that that, that, that that's you know with about environment we create for them can either can can make it so good. Even if they're ornery and they don't listen to us and they're stubborn and all that stuff, and still barky or still meowy, there's there's they're still living a better life. If we got our, our act together. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah. And and what you do is so important with that of being able to explain both sides, right? I mean, it's um I can help change a belief, but I can't help people understand what impacts are going on and explain situation. Yeah you know and so being able to find out that the dog is worried about 
the vacation or um, that you're really sad about something that has nothing to do <laughs> with, with the animal. My, my daughter had a Staffordshire Terrier, a 90 pound Staffordshire Terrier. Big, fierce looking dog, right? He was black and white named Oreo because <laughs> the collar was white. And um, he always thought he'd done something wrong. You know, whenever you were upset about anything, he always immediately assumed he had done something wrong, that you weren't pleased because of him. Uh, and I've noticed that tends to be, a, a, you know, I haven't had any other pit bull type dogs in the family, but I've certainly known many since then. And they all seem to take on the burden of guilt for anything that's going on. You know, they're yeah. pretty needy emotionally and needing that reassurance and the, you know, they want to be in your lap for unknown reasons. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's funny that you know they can they pick that up from somewhere this dog she hadn't had this dog in the you know in his very early years or months um and he'd had some tough things happen where he'd been punished for things that weren't his fault yeah and yeah and, and but he yeah. always like yeah had that guilt thing so being able to tell him he's okay you know this has nothing to do with you <laughs> <laughs> would be really helpful yeah, yeah. and I know you do that all the time of explaining that, that you know they're acting like this but it's not anything to do with you it's because yeah. of something totally different your example in the beginning of the the person who had lost one dog and that's why she was sad mm -hmm. nothing to do with the puppy yeah we've had those conversations of like it's a people thing you know let them it's like there's daddy being daddy let's keep let's move on <laughs> Right. Um, that's my simplification of it, but that's a really that's a very true statement. That that's a great example of how they take things on, and they they have their own beliefs, subconscious beliefs about what that behavior means, and that's that's where I'm getting in there. Oh, very cool. I'm I hope I can take you back to this. Did I ask the question earlier in a way that answers this one? Is there anything you can do about uh, either your subconscious beliefs, if you notice them? I know working with you is obviously something. It's always good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, that's, I'm saying like that's a given. Anything you can work with uh, on, on their own? or Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, one of, one of the things when I would start working with people is you've got to know what it is you want. It's not like what you want to stop, what you're trying to avoid, but what do you really want? And a lot of people don't even know that it's, they just know they want to avoid this thing that they're trying to, you know, not have happen. And so the first thing I always recommend people is figure out what it is you really want. And once you know what that is, start picturing how it really looks in detail. You know, get visual details. What are people saying? If there are any sensory, other sensory data there, describe it really clearly. Just immerse yourself in an example of how this is going to look. And most importantly, make sure that that includes the emotions you're feeling when this is true for you. And and sometimes I have seen that make a difference. I I'm just I'm so tickled to hear that because I actually tell people that that's what we're going to do with behavior. Sometimes is I'll give you the example I use the most is um, people don't like the way their dogs act when somebody comes into their house. I say, well, how do you want them to act? And they say, well, I want them to behave. I don't want them to. Sit behave doesn't mean anything give me a picture what what am I seeing and it's exactly am I seeing them sitting down with a happy right. tongue big in their tail I have they moved back waiting patiently um my one dog I told her I really wanted her to jump on the couch when people came and so and then the joy that you feel because they're doing it 
it's it's so so similar it's so much the same and and the visuals with i guess with us humans as well as with our animals are very powerful aren't they they are yeah and it does you know dovetail nicely with with your animal communication because that's a you know it's a visual and you know you're creating the image to yes. transmit that to to each other um and yeah so i mean i think that's um i hadn't thought of that until you just said it but i remember i've been in your classes i <laughs> yeah. when you're and i do it with my cat all the time when i'm asking them to do something i picture it when i'm saying it right yeah yeah that is really good uh, does anything else come to mind, Judy? Are there any other tips or ideas? Because that one's powerful, huge. Yeah, that's the most effective thing I've seen. Okay. The, the one thing for people to know is that they don't have to just say, well, this is just the way I am. If they've got these patterns, if they've got uh, things happening for no good reason that are not supporting what they would like to be going on, just know you can change it. Right. Don't get don't just assume that this is just going to be the way it is forever. It's you can do stuff about it. That is so good to hear. <laughs> right. Right. OK, that that's good. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything that I missed that you were like waiting to tell us about possibly your book or or anything else that you wanted to share about? Uh, I do have the book, which has got lots of clues about lots of situations, which might be helpful for people. Um, I've also got a whole bunch of free resources on my website um, that they can download and, you know, get a little bit more information or they can, from the website, they can book a 15 minute free call if they've got questions or want more information. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to, I'll be putting all that information below the video so I'm sure you will I appreciate that okay all right this is this has been really wonderful Judy thank you so much for taking the time to do this I enjoyed the conversation and I'm always happy to help people understand why this stuff is happening yeah. <laughs> so good all right so let me, let me thank you so much and everybody Mary Beth Decker I'm immersed in the conversation I can't speak sacredcrow.com where people with pets heal and connect and Judy King. Thanks. Thank you.